Hey guys! So in my last video I gave kind of a crash course in getting started with Arduino using an ESP32 development board. But one thing that I didn't cover is arguably the best feature of this board which is the built-in wireless capabilities. So today I'm going to show you how to set this up and show you a couple of different ways that you can use that in your projects to make it so that you can fetch data from the internet to use in your projects or make it so that you can control this using a web browser. So the project I came up with to illustrate the examples in this video is a Wi-Fi enabled accent lamp with a 3D printed enclosure driven by an ESP32 and these little guys. These are called NeoPixels from Adafruit and they're little multicolor LEDs that you can really easily wire up and control using just about any Arduino or Raspberry Pi like board. And I'll show you two examples using Wi-Fi. The first will be hosting a web page on the ESP32 so that you can set the color of the lamp using a web browser. The other example will turn it into kind of a daylight clock where during the day it's a sky blue color and it'll reach out to a couple of web services to get the current time as well as sunset and sunrise information. And then when it's time for the sun to set, it will fade through a nice sunset gradient until it's dark blue for nighttime. And then it will do the same thing in reverse when it's time for the sun to rise again. Now, before I get into everything, I've got a couple quick updates for you guys. First, the summer community competition is underway. This one is Arduino themed. That's why I've been doing these Arduino videos. So if you want to hear more about that, check out my last video where I explain all the rules and how it's going to work. It'll be going through the end of August, so you still have time to participate if you want to. Uh, second, just because I get asked about it constantly, yes, there will be more Minty Pie coming. There is a new version that we're working on that should be out in the coming months. Uh, keep an eye on my Instagram, that's where I usually post small updates for things like that. And then finally, I've got another giveaway for you guys. This time, a company called Scythen reached out and asked if I wanted to check out their helping hands that they sell, and they were nice enough to send me a second set to give away to one of you guys. So I've been using them for the last couple of weeks, and they're pretty nice. I would say that the base isn't quite as thick and sturdy as it is on the quad hands, but otherwise, very similar, and they've been working great. So if you want to win one of these, check out my Instagram account, and there should be a recent post about it. Adafruit sells NeoPixels in all kinds of different configurations, uh, in strips and rings and grids, as well as the individual ones like I'm using. Uh, this one on the right is meant for attaching header pins to and using in a breadboard. And this smaller one on the left has pads on the back of it where you can easily attach wires to. And there are two sets of three pads, one for input and one for output if you want to chain more than one together. And each of those sets has power, data, and ground. So now I'm going to attach some wires to connect the output pads on this one to the input pads on the next one. And you can do this over and over again to chain a bunch of them together. Now for attaching it to the board, you can remove the header pins if you want, but you don't have to. I'm connecting power to this pin right here, and then ground and data. If you're not using this exact ESP32 board, uh, your pins might be a little bit different. And this is what I came up with in Fusion 360. It's got a top part that serves as kind of a diffuser, and there's a base that has a spot where this particular ESP32 board fits perfectly into, and then there's a middle part that should fit five NeoPixels perfectly, and it points them in different directions so it should light up the whole thing nicely. So I used the Robo R2 where I could on this project. I wound up swapping out the hexagon hotend for an E3D hotend, and that definitely helped some with the reliability, but I was still running into issues with some materials, as I'll show you here in a minute. I tried a few different materials for the diffuser. Natural PLA came out a little bit too yellow for my liking. The color on Pet G came out a lot nicer, but it blocked too much of the light. And then I tried clear high heat PLA from Push Plastic, and it came out fantastic. This stuff is like printing with glass. It's super clear, and it refracts the light inside of the infill really nicely. This wound up being one of those materials that I just could not get the row to play nicely with no matter what I adjusted so I'm still working with them trying to figure out what's going on with that. I printed the base in wood fill PLA again from Push Plastic which is a really cool material for stuff like this because it looks and feels like wood and you can even sand and stain it if you want to. The middle part where the actual NeoPixels go, it doesn't matter what you use for that, I just use some black PLA. I wound up just gluing them into place and that worked just fine and you won't even see it once it's put together. And as usual, there'll be a blog post that goes along with this video, so check the description for that and I'll have links to all the parts that I used, all the code samples that I'll go over, as well as the STL files so you can print one of these out yourself if you want to. Now before we get to the more interesting examples, first I'm going to show you how to control the NeoPixels in an Arduino sketch. So first we're going to need to install a library to be able to interact with the pixels. 
There's an official one from Adafruit, but there are some issues using that with the ESP32, but sometimes the LEDs will just flash a random color or they'll flicker. So I was looking around online and there's another library that you can use called NeoPixel Bus, and the syntax for using it is almost exactly the same as the Adafruit one. So if you find some example code that you're trying to use, it should be really easy to make some small changes to use it with this library instead. So here's a really simple example. First we include that library that we installed, and then I'm defining the pin number that we're gonna use up here at the top, and then I define the number of pixels that we're gonna be using. Then also here at the top, we're creating a NeoPixel bus object. I named it pixels, and then we give it the number of pixels that we're using as well as the pin number. And then here in our setup function, we call the begin function on that pixels object. And below that, we're setting the pixel color on the first pixel, because it's zero index, and we're setting that to green. This RGB color is a data structure that they have in this library for representing different colors. So you can create it just by calling RGB color and then feeding it three values between zero and 255 for red, green, and blue. So now after we've done that, we have to call the show function on the pixels object. Anytime that you change the colors of any of the pixels, it won't actually display those new colors until you call this show function. So then if we run that, and you can see that one of the pixels has turned green. It's the first one in the strip. So if we want to turn them all on, we can just put that in a for loop. So now if we run it again, it will loop over all the pixels, set the color to green, and then show them. And that's about it for using this library. The library comes with a bunch of examples that you can use to see how to do more interesting things like fading between two different colors and things like that. So now I'll show you how to make it connect to your Wi-Fi. It's actually pretty simple. First we include the Wi-Fi library, which you should already have. And then here I'm defining the SSID for my network as well as the password. And then I went ahead and called serial.begin so that we can output stuff to the serial monitor. And then right here is where we actually tell it to connect. And you notice I'm calling wifi.disconnect first. I was running into an issue where sometimes it just wouldn't connect. And this was a solution that somebody posted online and seemed to fix it for me. Then we call wifi.begin and we give it our SSID and our password. And then down here, we're just waiting for it to actually connect. So we've just got a while loop here that checks the wifi.status function and sees if it has connected yet. If it hasn't, then we wait for a second, print something out so we know it's still doing something. It should get past that in a few seconds, and then we print out the IP address that we've been assigned. And then sure enough, if we run it, after a few seconds, it will connect and it'll give us its IP address. So these next examples are quite a bit more complicated. There's really just no way around it when you start getting into stuff like sending and receiving data from a web server or it acting like a web server itself. So I'll do my best to explain everything that's going on, but at the very least, you should be able to just use this code as is if you want to. This first one will make the board act as a web server, serving up a little web page with a color picker on it. So from any device that's on the same network, you'll be able to open it up from a web browser and set the color. So we've got roughly the same code for setting up the Wi-Fi and the NeoPixels, and then we've got a few more libraries that we're pulling in. These two are for making it act as a web server, and then this library is really handy because it'll make it so that we don't have to remember the IP address that was assigned to the ESP32 if we want to access it. This color picker header file that we're pulling in is actually the HTML that the server is going to send back whenever we access it. So we've got our stuff defined for the pixels and the Wi-Fi. And then here I've got a few more variables that I'll use to keep track of what color it currently is and what color it's being set to. And then here we create the actual server object and we're telling it to listen on port 80. And then here's pretty much the same Wi-Fi setup code that I showed you before. Now this is what will make it so that we can enter in pixels.local into our web browser and that'll take us to the ESP32 rather than having to type in its IP address. This same functionality is supposedly built in to the Wi-Fi library, but I could not get it working for whatever reason on the ESP32. But this other library seems to work fine. Now with these two function calls, we're telling the server what to do when it gets a request. So whenever it gets a get request, we're sending back the HTML that we have in that header file. And then down here, whenever we get a post request, we're grabbing the red, green, and blue parameters that are being sent with that request. So we're reading those values and then storing them in the red, green, blue integers that I defined up above. So then down here in the loop function, we're checking to see if any of the colors have changed. And if they have, then we'll save those values so that we'll be able to check and see if they changed again next time. And then we're setting all the pixels to the new color. And then we call pixels.show to display the new color. The code for this actual color picker is an open source project called Flexi Color Picker. And I chose this one because it's super simple. It's just one JavaScript file and some CSS. So I took the minified version of that JavaScript as well as all the CSS and put it into an HTML file. And all this stuff at the top is that color picker CSS. 
And then here, this single really long line here is the minified version of that color picker. So this div right here is where the actual color picker is in the HTML. And then there's a little bit of JavaScript to set up the color picker right here. And so what this does is anytime that you select a different color, the color picker will run this code. So we set the background color for the web page right here. And then we call this JavaScript function that I have above with the new red, green, blue values that were given to us by the color picker. So then to this function up here, we're sending it our parameters and the path that we want to send it to. We're just sending it to the root of the website. What this will do is it will use an XML HTTP request to send the new values that we got down here back to the server. Now you can't just use this HTML as is. We have to turn it into a string that we can use in our Arduino sketch. So to do that, you can just select everything and then go to this web page right here, which will let you paste in a bunch of text and convert it into a string that we can use in our sketch. So then here in that header file that I showed you earlier, that's where I put that string and I'm defining it as a character array called HTML. And again, that's what gets sent back by the server whenever it gets a GET request. This keyword here, progmem, what that does is it makes it so that this string gets stored in the program memory on the actual flash rather than in RAM. So if you're using a bunch of data like this and you don't want to actually load that into memory, because these boards don't have very much, if you declare it like this, then you won't be using up any RAM with this large amount of data. And that's about it for this example. I know that was probably a lot to take in, especially if you're new to programming, but hopefully at least some of it made sense. And again, if nothing else, you should be able to use this code as is. This last example is definitely my favorite, but it's also by far the most complicated. The idea was that the color of the lamp would change depending on the time of day for the current time of year and your geographic location. So during the daytime, it would be this kind of sky blue color and slowly pulse. And then as nighttime and sunset approaches, it would fade through a sunset gradient to become a dark blue color for nighttime. And then the same thing would happen in reverse when dawn comes around and the sun starts to rise. What you're watching here is sped up quite a bit. When it's happening in real time, the fading takes place over the course of a couple of hours. Now, in order for this to work, we're gonna need a couple of pieces of information. We're gonna need to know the current date and time, and we'll also need to know what time the sun is going to rise and set on the current day. Both of those things are dependent on your location. So you'll need to go and get your latitude and longitude. Google Maps is probably the easiest way to get it. And then we'll plug it into this Arduino sketch. Now, as you can see, there's a lot to cover here. I feel like I've commented it pretty well, and I've also added a lot of debug output. So hopefully with those things and going over it really quickly, you'll get a pretty good idea of how this works. So we're including a bunch of libraries that we need up here at the top. This is a time library that makes it really easy to keep track of what time it is. A JSON library for parsing the JSON responses that we'll get from the web APIs that we're gonna hit. This HTTP client library, which should have come with the Arduino IDE. The NeoPixel bus library that we used in the other examples, we're bringing in the NeoPixel animator which is part of the NeoPixel bus library. That'll make it really easy to tell the pixels to fade between two different colors. And then this gradient header file. This is the gradient that I made in Photoshop to represent both sunset and sunrise. So what I did was I took this image and I ran it through this online tool that will spit out an array of red, green, blue values that we can work with pretty easily within our sketch. So this header file has all of those values that that tool gave us. This debug mode, you can turn that on if you want. It was something that I was using while I was working on this sketch to make it so that it would always think that the sun was about to rise so that I could test out the code easier. So if you want to do that for some reason, you can just turn this to one and that will enable debug mode. Uh, latitude and longitude, this is not my latitude and longitude. This is somewhere in Florida. So you need to put yours in here if you're gonna be using this code. An API key for using timezonedb.com. Again, if you want to use this code, you'll have to go there and sign up. It's free and they'll send you an API key that you can plug in here. Some values for setting up the Wi-Fi and the NeoPixels, like I showed in the previous examples. Some variables to keep track of time, uh, the NeoPixel stuff that we'll be using, and a couple variables to keep track of the current color that the pixels are set to and the next color that we're fading them to. These keep track of where we are within this gradient. This is the amount of time that it takes to fade from one pixel color to the next. In debug mode, that value is much smaller so that you can watch that whole fade process much quicker. This is the total amount of time that it will take to fade all the way through this gradient. GMT off Set. This is something that we'll get from that time zone DB API call. Got our setup function here. We're turning on serial so that we can spit stuff out to the serial monitor. We tell the pixels to begin and set all the pixels to black. The set color function is something that I defined down here just to make it easier and faster to set all the pixels to a given color. Function to make it easy to connect to Wi-Fi. This is a function that will pass to the animator and it will wind up calling this function every time that it needs to update the color of the pixels. There's a lot more info about how that works on their GitHub repository. And this function 
function here is what actually makes the call to the timezonedb.com web API. So we build the URL, given the API key that you were given, along with your latitude and longitude. We tell the client to begin, make the actual request, check to see if we got a status code. In other words, did we get a response? And if we did, then we get the payload from that response. Now we check to see if the status code is 200 to make sure there weren't any errors in our request. This is stuff for using that Arduino JSON library. Again, there's all kinds of information on their website for how that works. So we tell the JSON library to parse the response and we check to see if there were any errors in that process. And then we start grabbing values from the parsed JSON. This one here is just the current time in a nice formatted string that it sends back. This is a Unix timestamp that it also sends for the current time. Uh, that's what the time library is gonna be using. Then we grab the GMT offset for our location, which will also take into account things like daylight savings time, print out everything so that we can see what we got. And then we set the current time given that Unix timestamp that we got back from that API call. And then we save the current day so that we can compare that with the current time to see if it's time to grab new sunrise and sunset data. This function is for use with this other API that we'll be using, the sunrise sunset API. This function is for translating between a formatted string and this time t data type that the time library uses. So this function is what fetches the sunrise and sunset data that we'll be using to figure out when to fade through that gradient. It works pretty much the same as the function above for getting the current time. So I'll skip over most of this. Uh, this is the URL that it's hitting given your latitude and longitude and the current date. Now we don't use the sunrise and sunset times as they come back from the service. We actually wind up offsetting them by half of the total amount of time that we want to use for fading across that gradient. So that way it starts fading before we actually get to sunset and sunrise rather than fading through that gradient when the sun is already down. This is where if we have debug mode turned on, it'll pretend that the sun is about to rise given the current time. This function will calculate the current Y position within this gradient given the current time of day and sunrise and sunset times. It's pretty well documented, so if you're curious about how that works, it should be pretty easy to walk through. And then same thing down here for calculating the X position. So say we're on the first row up here for daytime. It doesn't just stay on one color all the time. It kind of fades back and forth on this gradient within that same row. So this will calculate where in the X axis it should be. So here in the loop, we check to see if it's a new day, meaning we need to fetch new daylight info. First we connect to Wi-Fi. We set the current time again, just in case our time has drifted at all or, or daylight savings time has started or ended. And then we fetch the sunrise and sunset time. After we do that, we disconnect and turn off the Wi-Fi until we need it again, at which point we'll reconnect. So we save the current time for use in those calculations above for the X and Y values. And then here we check if we're in the middle of animating between two different colors. If we are, we tell the animator to update itself and then we show the new color. If it's not animating, meaning that we're done fading from one color to the next, then we go ahead and update our X position. So I know I kind of rushed through that, but there was a lot to get through in this video it would be really long if I went step by step on it. So I put a lot of comments in there and a lot of debug output. So hopefully between what I just walked through and all that, you'll be able to see how this works. I was trying to keep this video short, that didn't happen, but I hope you learned something that will help you make your Arduino projects even better by adding Wi-Fi and internet connectivity into the mix. As always, thanks for watching guys, and I'll see you next time.